Hey everybody and welcome back. In today's video we're going to be talking about clutch and flywheel replacements on the 2004 Corolla here. As you can see I'm already in the middle of doing the intake manifold gasket replacement and as long as I'm in there I might as well do this as well since it's going to give me a lot more working room. And so what we're going to try is something that I haven't seen in any other YouTube video. I've watched a bunch of videos on this already. This video is going to be testing a theory that I have a friend who's a mechanic and he said that on this generation of Corolla, he's able to replace a clutch without pulling the transmission all the way out of the vehicle. He just undoes, you know, first you undo everything you have to. Once you get to the transmission, take out all the bolts, keep it on a lift, slide it this way, and then there's enough room without disconnecting all of the cables and everything that you can just sneak up in there and get the parts replaced that you need to. So that's what we're going to try to do today. And if that doesn't work out for me at home, because he was obviously at a shop and he had an overhead lift and everything that made it a little bit easier, but we're going to try it here, mostly on the ground, and we're going to see how well that works out. So let's take a look at what parts we're working with. I'm putting in a new flywheel, which don't forget to new get new bolts for that as well, since the stock ones are torqued to yield. I'm trying out this brand, which claim to be reusable, so that should be better than, re than throwing them away each time. I'm putting on new rotors and pads. That's completely unrelated, but just because mine are warped, and I figured as long as I'm in there, I might as well. And then the clutch, you got the clutch itself, as well as the pressure plate and throwout bearing. Now, a little bit of clarification. There's two general models of the Corolla. There's the standard, which is the CE, the LE, and the S trim, which all have the 1ZZ engine and the five-speed manual, if it's a manual. And then there's the performance one, which is the XRS, and that has the 2ZZ engine and the six-speed manual. Now, the flywheel is specific to your engine. So if you have the 1ZZ like me, we get the 1ZZ flywheel. If you have the 2ZZ, get the one for that. The bolts are interchangeable though, as well as the clutch kits themselves. So I'm getting the ASIN OEM clutch kit, but this is normally for the six-speed manual found in the XRS. However, it should fit fine and offer a little bit longer life since it's stronger, built for the stronger engine, even though I'm putting it in my standard one. The only thing I don't love about it is that it uses these rubber blocks rather than springs. Uh, which I think is a little bit weird, but you know, Toyota's pretty smart. They know what they're doing. And then over here, as far as tools you're going to need, you're going to need all the basic hand tools, sockets, wrenches, you need jacks, all that type of stuff. This is a big job. But the only tools you might not already have are a 24 millimeter to drain the oil out of the transmission, a 30 millimeter axle nut socket, which needs to be 12 point for Toyota's OEM axle nuts. And then I'm going to try using, it's not completely necessary, but a flywheel turning tool so that I don't have to put, try and put a wrench on the other side of the engine and turn it while I'm tightening stuff up and moving things around. I think that'll help make it a little bit easier. Before you get the car super high off the ground, now's a good time to drain the transmission fluid. You can see under here, there's the drain bolt right there for that. Since it's going to drain better with the car more level, and then also, don't forget about safety. It's definitely the most important. I'm going to even be using my big rubber block today because of how high we're going to be going. And don't forget about ear protection also if you're going to be using impact tools because it is loud, no arguing that. And then anyways, the real thing of importance here is to check out how these nuts work. Now before you go slamming your impact gun on here and banging away at it, you're going to have to use something, a punch or something like that, to take this indent out. Now, instead of using a cotter pin with a castle nut, the modern day uh, axle nuts use this sort of indented style where you take a different punch when you're done and you punch it in. But for what we're gonna need to do, don't forget to use that. And if you're really paranoid about getting the torques back right, just take a pen here, a marker pen, and just put a line right there and now you can remember, even though you'll have the indent pulled out and out, what you can do is now you know it when you torque it back down, assuming that they did it right last time, it'll return to the same spot and then you'll know you're right. Next up, after you've got the axle nut off, just gently tap the shaft with a soft punch and a hammer and then loosen that up to where it's free. And then you're going to have to remove it. So you can either go under here and undo those three there 
which is the traditional way to do it, and then swing this out. Or I saw another person who undid the strut bolts and the hose bolt there, and then was able to swing this forward to get it out also. So you could try either of those, but I'm going to do the underside traditional way. I got the three lower bolts off. Those were super tight. And then I was able to hold this back using a ratchet strap to the rear wheel. And now is probably one of the hardest parts of the job is just getting this guy out. And I want to warn you of something so that you don't do what I did is make sure that when you're prying on this thing, don't do that with your crowbar because that is is bad because that's going to damage the seal if it ever turns. So now I have to fix that before I put this back in. So just don't do that and make sure to learn from me. Probably what you want to do is buy a slide hammer that fits this before you start this and that would make it a lot easier. I was able to get the CV shaft out using some redneck ingenuity aka a piece of rope tied around the end here and then a sledgehammer over here. It took about 10 good slams, but eventually it slid out. So now I just gotta repeat the same thing over on the other side. And here's a close up of the damage that I did using that crowbar down there. So just be really careful if you are gonna use a crowbar, put it on here or put it on this lip. Don't put it here because now I gotta use a flathead and fix that. And as long as we're talking about things not to do, make sure that the CV axle shaft here is completely free from the hub before you take out the nuts and bolts down here or else your CV axle shaft will try and pull out up here and you don't want that. Here's an up close example of how the sledgehammer slide hammer works. So you've got your rope tied around there and then it just comes over here and I just wrapped it around there a bunch of times so I didn't have to tie a permanent knot. And then here's an example of it in action. Oof, didn't work that time. Watch out while you're doing this though. The first time when I went to tie it back underneath, I noticed that the rope had done just what the crowbar did. So now I gotta fix this side too. So now that we have the CV axles out, I'm gonna go ahead and show you what we're working with in here. I already took out the battery, the battery tray, and the air box just to get a better view and also to have easier access to the transmission mount here. Uh, word of warning, you're probably going to end up breaking a couple of these bolts. You can see I broke two of them holding the air box in if you're in a rusty area. You know, you can try using lubrication and heat and impact tools and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, just invest in a good tap and die set and because you're going to be using it working on stuff up here. And so anyways, once we support the transmission with a jack, then we're going to work on getting this mount here out and this mount down here out. And then we can start working on the bolts around here and pulling the starter out. And then I wanted to show you also, here's those CV axles now that they're out. You can see I was able to fix where I had bent it in, but you just got to be super careful not to scratch these bearing surfaces or not bearing and seal as well. Because the primary thing is if this is scratched, the seal will leak and then you'll leak transmission fluid, you'll have to replace them. And here you can see why it was so hard to pull these out. There's actually these retaining clips that hold them in. So that's what we were fighting against when we were pulling on it right there. Some good news, I was able to use a torch and some vice grips to get out the two studs that had broken off. And then I used a tap 
to recut the threads in all three of them to make sure that those threads were nice and uh, good looking for when I put it back together. I have the car up higher now. I got the starter pulled out, which even that was a bit of a hassle. There's a 14 millimeter socket bolt there and then one down here and I kind of had to mallet it out of there. Next we're going to work on getting these two mounts out as I was saying. And I made a little jig here that I'm going to use. Basically, it's going to be kind of like this so that I can lift the transmission at when I need to separate it. And then I'm going to use the other jack kind of like that. And then this small bottle is going to control the movement like that. And then I'm going to use this jack down here to support the engine. I'm finishing up getting the motor mounts out now. This one here on the transmission end was really easy to get out, but that one down there was a lot harder and I'll show you what I did to get that bolt out. I wasn't seeming to be able to get it out because it was in there so tight and the solution was to use a third jack and jack up the subframe here to then support the weight so that this bolt I could then be able to freely take it out of the hole there. Because without this jack, the flex in the subframe was so much that the bolt was basically getting stuck on that there. An update on where we're at, I'm working on getting all the bell housing bolts out. I've got all of them out except the top one that I left in to do last. I disconnected that connector and a ground wire and all of the little clips on the harness, but I left the harness itself there. Anyways though, here's the one that I'm leaving in and there's one for the starter. And then there's another one right there that I took out. And I'll come over here and show you. Unfortunately, this diagram in the book isn't really accurate. Uh, but what's a good idea to do is to make a cardboard cutout. For example, here's the one I used with the Prius when I did the head gasket. This was for the valve, the or not the valve, the timing cover for the timing chain and stuff. You can see how many there were there. Luckily we only have six here, but these two are actually more like here. This one's down here. 17 and 14's here. These you get to from the back side though, and I'll show you that right now. There's two of them up here, right there and there. And then there's the other two right up there. Unfortunately, the rear motor mount also has to come out to be able to pull the transmission out. And that's the one that's way down in there. And this one's honestly the hardest. So the only motor mount that actually stays is the one over there. I added a strap. I'm probably just being paranoid, but I felt like the engine was starting to slide backwards a little bit. And I just wanted to make sure it had the best support it could. But anyways, that one in there... You can see I have the bolt out already through the center. And then there's four bolts under here you have to do. There's one here, a nut actually, a bolt. And then there's a bolt in each one of these holes here that has to come out. I've got the engine and transmission starting to split now. I left in one bolt at the top to hold it and while I get it apart, but it's pretty hard. They were basically, it felt like glued together, so that was really annoying. The only place I could manage to get a crowbar in to start crowbarring is right where the tip of that crowbar is there. Of course, you'd do it the other way if you were actually doing it, but just to show you, I put it that way. And then also, just, you know, the way things go around here is I realized that this thing is going to be in the way here, is going to hit this as we start to lower things. So I went to remove this, and of course one of the bolts broke there, so that's really great. But anyways, um, you know, just use a torch and impact tools basically everywhere to loosen these stupid bolts up if you've got rust, because they're just, they're snapping left and right. All right, so we've made a lot of progress. I had my friend come over who's a mechanic, and he's been helping me out a lot. As you can see, we've got it split quite a bit now, and it looks like it's going to be super hard 
to get in there without pulling the transmission out more. So we're going ahead with trying to remove the transmission rather than just being able to leave all of the cables and stuff connected. But in there, we were able to use that clip that I just dropped there. But we got those clips out for these cables. And then all that's left pretty much is this uh, soft line undoing one of the ends of that as well as a few miscellaneous wires, but I already undid most of the wiring. And then we're going to see if we can just sneak it out under here. Supposedly we're not supposed to be able to without removing the subframe, but it looks like it might be possible. So we've got the transmission far enough out to access the bolts here on the pressure plate. And we've disconnected, as I said before, those the shift cables, but we've left on this, this soft line has enough play in it to just be able to pull it out here. And so what I've been using is I've been using this flywheel tool here to basically, it's a little bit hard to show but it, with one hand, but it grabs onto the teeth of the flywheel and then it lets you turn it or hold it in place. And so I've popped all of the six bolts out and now I've just got the three pins and pretty much this should be the last pin to loosen up and it should just be coming right out as you can see. So we're going to keep working on this, get this guy out, then look at the clutch, see how much wear it has, and then start working on the flywheel. So before we look at the clutch, I'm actually just going to pull the flywheel out as well and then we can look at all three at the same time. Using the holding tool here, I was able to break free all of those bolts in there using the 12.14 millimeter socket. It wasn't actually as hard as I was thinking it was going to be, so we've got a lot of working room and it worked out really well. So I'm going to pull that out and then we'll look at all of them on the table over there. Just one more thing, as Columbo might say, before we go ahead and look at the parts. I wanted to talk about what we can see in here. First off, we've got the rear main seal there. Now, a lot of people would replace that if they've gone to the work of pulling everything apart. But I hate to say it, but I'm personally going to just leave it alone. Now you might be thinking, well that's really dumb, but look, you can see it's not at all leaking, it's not even seeping. And I mean, if they did it this good at the factory, I'm not sure if I could press in a new seal as well with this amount of working room as they got it there and have it not leak and not accidentally scratch the bore or something like that. So I'm just going to leave that alone. You know, if it bites me in the butt later, then I'll have learned my lesson, but I'm leaving it alone. Also to note here is that this transmission and engine, there isn't actually a pilot bearing in there. So the only bearing that we're going to be dealing with here is this thrust bearing or pivot bearing or whatever it's called. And so we're going to pull this guy off. You can see I have the gloves on. And then also take out this shift fork right here, which you can see it's got the rubber boot, but well, what will happen is you'll be able to just slide it out of the boot once we get these apart. So I'm going to get those out, and then we're going to go ahead and go over to the table and look at the parts, which I know you've been waiting for to see. Here they are. Here are the parts, new and old. As you can see, let's take a look here first on the pressure plate. You can see that that's just totally glazed over. Definitely needs to be replaced. The new one, of course, has a flat finish being brand new, but once it wears in, this is supposed to look more like a brake rotor here. So a sort of, not really a mirror finish, but a sort of semi-reflective finish. Whereas this one is just like totally, you can see my hand there, just totally mirrored because of all the heat that it was, it was dealing with. Here we've got the clutch itself. I mean, it's not completely down to the rivets, but it's definitely worn quite a bit. So it's good that we're getting that replaced as well. Here's the new one. You can see a lot of depth here in the grooves. And then we've got the flywheel over here. Same sort of thing as the pressure plate. A super mirrored glazed finish to that. Very worn, too much heat. And then the new one, of course, still has that machined surface. And then the last thing here is we've got the new bolts versus the old ones, which we're going to throw away. But we do need to keep these here, which are the bolts that hold the pressure plate on. Those are fine. Those don't have a lot of torque on them, so those get reused. And then as well, here we've got the throwout bearing, and you can see how it kind of just clips in there to the fork. 
and we're going to want to lubricate any pivot points. So right here, and then on the un on the side inside there, and then on the underside up under here, lubricate that all with a lot of grease so that it we don't have any excess wear. But there you have it. There are the parts. I'm definitely glad that I did end up getting all new parts, including the flywheel, since a lot of people might just try and do a clutch only. But as you can see, with the wear that's on these from being overheated in the past, it's really good that we got in here and replaced everything. Okay, let's talk flywheel installation. First off, we're going to put back in the shift fork here with the new throwout bearing. I went ahead and greased those points, uh, like I was saying earlier. And then, as far as the flywheel goes, these are special bolts and they come with some special instructions. And you can pause the video if you want to read those there. But Basically, the difference is that rather than using the torque to yield style ones here that you put to 36 foot pounds and then 90 degrees, which is the OEM spec, these just go to a straight 70 foot pounds without any degrees since they're not torque to yield. And you just got to make sure that they fit in here into your flywheel and can go down all the way, which you can see we got no problems there. And then you can see the length is the same as the original ones. It says very specifically not to use washers. So even though this has a wider head, uh, don't use any washers on this. And then the last kind of instruction is you're supposed to put thread locker on the threads, but then this included assembly lubricant on the sort of this part of the head here so that when you're torquing it down, it locks in place with the thread locker, but then the torque spec is correct since it isn't getting any friction there on the back side of the head. I forgot to mention when you're putting in the shift fork, don't forget to clean and grease this shaft surface right here. Not really a shaft, but the shaft actually rides inside of there, the transmission. But clean this surface here that it's, it rotates around. And then also, hopefully it goes without saying, but when you're putting in the bolts, don't forget to do them in a star pattern for the flywheel. Same thing with like lug nuts or something like that. And then torque them all multiple times to the specs so that you make sure you get them all even and correct. Okay, so big word of warning here that I just found out myself is that these are the original ones here and they use a 14 millimeter 12 point socket, but you can see that the aftermarket ones are actually larger. They use a 16 12 point. So I never would have guessed they would have changed the head size, but 16, make sure you have a 16 millimeter 12 point. That's a commonly skipped size in a lot of sets and a lot of people don't have any 12 points. So I'm lucky I was able to find that socket in my travel set that I take to junkyards. But anyways, you can see here I've got all the other ones in down in there and I just got to go ahead and tighten them all down and while I'm in here I'll go ahead and show you here's the shift fork there the clutch fork uh, and then when you're putting that in just make sure that this pin on the slave cylinder here aligns right there and that's pretty much it just a big word of warning 16 millimeter not 14 like the OEM I was able to get the flywheel bolts put in no problem, got them torqued down and held the flywheel using the holding tool. You can see them in there. So now let's talk about the biggest technical challenge we're going to have during this project is going to be clutch alignment. So you can see on the box here, I'm supposed to be getting this nice looking alignment tool, but all that came in my box was this thing, which I think is just a, for shipping a spacer or something. But anyways, I was able to Google... 1ZZ, or sorry, look up that 1ZZ on Thingiverse and found somebody that had made a design to 3D print an alignment tool, so that's nice. Anyways, basically what you're doing with alignment is you've got your flywheel and you've got your clutch going on. You got to have it centered along the axis of the shaft because if you have it off, for example, like that, and then you go and you put this on, it wouldn't be this much, but, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating it to show you. And then you go to put this on, you can see when your shaft goes in, it's not going to, it's going to hit the side, it's not going to go in. So this has to be aligned, which is where the alignment tool comes in. And so what you got to do, my understanding anyways, of how it works, is you're going to have these together, and you're going to walk them over and sort of slide them in, and then as you put them in, the alignment tool 
you can see fits in here nice and tight so you could and then basically since that's going to be tight now then that's going to help you get everything aligned don't forget to clean this surface off with brake clean though before you uh, go to put anything together so now comes putting the clutch and pressure plate in you can see here we've got the clutch make sure that you put the fat side out on this one if you put it the other way then it'll hit the bolts and it won't actually seat all the way but you can see how the alignment tool it's not a hundred percent perfect fit but it's good enough to where when we press it on it's going to keep that clutch aligned in there on the flywheel so that then when we put the pressure plate on everything stays centered and the shaft can go in for this guy we've got the six bolts over here we're reusing the torque spec is 14 foot pounds which is 168 inch pounds if you want to be precise about it like me and once we get this together we just put the transmission back on the engine which will probably be the hardest part and then we'll be on in the home stretch we'll be in good shape so I just found out you actually have to sit the pressure plate inside the transmission if you're doing it my way with the transmission only this far apart I wasn't able to get the pressure plate between the shaft and the alignment tool when I was doing it this way. So now that we have this in here, I put the clutch back on with the alignment tool. Now we're going to go ahead and put them together. Okay, I've got the pressure plate on. Got all the bolts torqued down. And the biggest takeaway here is just make sure that you have one of these alignment tools, whether you make sure your kit comes with one or buy one or print one or whatever, because you're never going to get that to go through if it's not centered. But anyways, this is on. Just make sure that when you're putting it on, you align the pins with the pin holes and not the bolt holes on accident. You can see here on the old one. Uh, they're going to be pretty tight. You're almost going to have to drive them down with the bolts, but that's how it works. And so anyways, we got it together. Now we're putting the transmission back on the engine. So after about 30 minutes of wiggling and fighting and trying to get them together, it looks like I've got the shaft on. And I want to show you a view you probably don't see from many YouTubers is actually inside the transmission. I've got my boroscope in there and you can see this is right there. You've got the pressure plate and there's the shaft and there's the throw out bearing all right there like how it is inside. And you can I was trying to see if I could see the splines lining up and it didn't really help to see that so I just had to use the crowbar and keep turning the flywheel until eventually I was able to squeeze them together so now I just gotta real gently continue to push everybody together and start doing the bolts but you don't want to force the bolts you want to just have everything should just gently fit together you shouldn't have to be torquing them to force it together if you're doing that you're gonna break something so just Get it sliding until it's basically all the way together before you start putting any real torque down on it. I've got the engine and transmission snugged pretty close together now and I'm going to start putting in the bolts that are going to tighten the bell housing. Just do it evenly so that the gap is equal around the whole area. You don't want to skew anything. Other than that though, I also zip tied back this cl the clutch fork here for the throw out bearing. I don't know if you really need to do that but just to make sure that there wasn't any extra force on that. Um, as far as torque specs go, pretty much we're looking at these here, which then correspond to this photo, which as I said earlier isn't completely accurate, but you can pause here if you want to see if any of these are useful for you. And then I was using the cheap tap and die set to heal some of the bolts that go to different things that were all corroded. As far as it goes though, I'm pretty much going to stop doing the step-by-step -step guide here because all of these next steps are going to be pretty straightforward since you've seen how everything comes apart. That's going to be a real pain to get that back motor mount out. But other than that, the starter, the front motor mount, hooking the wiring, which honestly the only wiring is that connector in a ground and putting the harness back on the clips. Very simple. Putting this stuff back in, that'll all be a piece of cake. Things are going back together relatively smoothly aside from the terrible time I had trying to get that rear motor mount back in. But, you know, you'll figure it out eventually. It's just really a hassle. But pretty much we got all the motor mounts back in. And then I'm just going to go over this thing. I was able to retap the broken bolt. I'm going to use new hardware all around for the shift linkage. Make sure this part doesn't fall off. 
I'm going to put in new shift bushings, which I'm actually making an entirely separate video that I'll link below along with that intake manifold video, which getting the old ones of those off wasn't as easy as you'd hope it to be either. Uh, these were really a stickler when we were first, me and when I had my friend come over to help me getting these off. Basically, what I'd recommend is take a crowbar and then they'll be in there like this, tap on the side and rotate them until they're like this and then pry them out. That was the only way we could get those out to remove these, the shift cables, but those will be going back in. And then over here, as long as you're doing all this, if you didn't disconnect the, the soft line for the clutch, you don't technically have to bleed it, but you might as well. We just got a little eight millimeter here and you can see it shares with the brake fluid that goes to that clutch cylinder in there. So just top off that and crack this open and bleed it just like you're doing brakes. And then finally we've got the transmission fluid. You can see basically what you do is you're going to take a funnel and there's the plug down there. And then you just put your funnel here. Make sure to use the right fluid. It's recommended to use GL4 fluid since it's safer on the brass synchros inside rather than GL5. And pretty much you just fill it until it starts dripping back out of the fill hole. That's, then you'll know it's full. It'll be about two quarts. Last few things I wanted to cover before I'm done here. Here are some torque specs. You can pause the video if you need those for when you're doing the motor mounts. Down here on the CV axles, you can see uh, what you're going to need to do is really lube this up good with either grease or transmission fluid and then have the pin facing down. That'll apparently help it go in easier. You'll take a hammer and tap on the end there to slide these into there once you get around to that. And then up on this side, I've got the brake fluid reservoir open. Top that off with clean fluid. I'm doing a quick vacuum bleed here with the vacuum pump on that clutch slave cylinder you can see down there. And then once I get that vacuum bled, I'll do a traditional pump release bleeding to get any residual air out. And lastly, we've got the new shift bushings in down here, which you can see right there, as well as this arm reattached. Well, that's going to be it for this video. My last technical tip of the day is regarding the axle nuts. If you're having a tough time getting them on or off, just put a screwdriver into the veins of the rotor and then you can use that to brace against as you tighten or loosen. Torque spec for this is 159 foot-pounds and those bolts down there are 66 foot-pounds that are for that ball joint section. But Anyways, big takeaways here is that this is a lot harder than some of those other videos you might have seen make it look. You were able to see firsthand somebody working on the ground here. It is really like a war of attrition down in the trenches being underneath that car, getting the, the rear motor mount and, so, and the front one's not that bad, but every time you got to get a different tool, you got to crawl in and out, in and out, you know, you forget you need a ratchet, you need a breaker bar, you need a different socket. You can't really use a creeper because you're not going to be able to torque anything because it'll just spin. But, you know, anyways, to compare it to the other biggest job I've done, the Prius head gasket, I would say that was definitely a better value in the sense that what a shop would charge you is a lot more and I would say it was honestly slightly easier than this. More technically challenging, more little pieces, but overall this was just so much, you know, maybe, maybe I'm really weak, but it just a lot of heavy movements, lifting, bending, stuff like that, a lot of work. But anyways, you know, hopefully you enjoyed it, hopefully it'll help you out, and don't forget to like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Leave a comment, you know, I'm still pretty small time, I read all of them, I hardly get any, so, you know, hey, I want the criticism, I want the, you know, the comments, I want to hear what you think. And so anyways, see you next time. Bye.